Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Juggler66, Hour of the Truth. This one's called Hour of the Truth meets Inquisition Update, the origin of futurism and preterism and we are in part 13 of the reading of this booklet that I've just named. Today with me again is my wonderful brother in Christ, Tom Fress from Inquisition Update and um, we are going to read the probably last pages. We are on page 62 currently and the booklet has 67 pages. But before we're going to start, of course, I want to introduce you, my brother in Christ, Tom Fress. How are you doing, Tom? Welcome Hi, to the I'm podcast. I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. Yerk, nice to be with you and you with your listeners and revealing the wonderful truths about Daniel's prophecy Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, which were perfectly and completely fulfilled by the Messiah, Jesus Christ, 2,000 years ago during the 70th and final week of uh, Daniel's prophecy. And it's my pleasure to get to show from God's infallible word the fulfillment of every element of Daniel's prophecy. We're going to see it from the scriptures. And we need to ask ourselves, who are we going to believe? Are we going to believe God? Are we going to believe his infallible scriptures and believe the truth as is recorded in the New Testament? Or are we going to believe fallible men? That's the question. Now, we've been taught in all the churches that the 70th week of Daniel is yet future that God lopped off the 70th week of Daniel from the 69th week and cast the 70th week of Daniel all the way to the end of time. It's illogical, it's unscriptural, it's a lie, and it leads to the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. The biblical, historical, and prophetic truth is that Jesus fulfilled the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy completely and perfectly 2,000 years ago during his ministry. He was anointed in the River Jordan at the beginning of the 70th week. He gave his life a ransom for us on the, on the three and a half years after his baptism and through the gospel, of, uh, through the spirit of Jesus Christ, the apostles continued to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ until the end of that 70th week of Daniel that was that was prophesied for the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, which occurred in 70 A.D., and the gospel went to the Gentiles. I want the listeners to know that the New Testament is the infallible recording, the historical recording of the fulfillment of every element of Daniel's prophecy the 70th week of Daniel, 2,000 years ago by Jesus Christ. We have our Messiah. He did what he said he would do. It's over. And now the reality begins to sink in that if the 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled perfectly and completely by Jesus Christ, our Messiah, 2,000 years ago, that his ministry, marking the beginning as his baptism by John, three and a half years later by his crucifixion and three and a half years later by the going forth of the gospel to the Gentiles, seeing that the Jews counted themselves not worthy of his salvation, then what's all this talk about a future 70th week? And for what purpose? That purpose is to cause you, whether you are willing to admit it or not, to deny that Jesus was the fulfillment of that 70th week that there must be a future 70th week, and through that future 70th week, these prophecies are going to be fulfilled, and the purpose of that is to present to the world a false Christ, okay, a false Messiah. Satan didn't like the way God fulfilled Daniel's prophecy 2,000 years ago, so he wants a do-over, and the futurists are paving the way for Satan's do-over of Daniel's 70th week, and the purpose for which it can only be to present 
to the world a false messiah. One more point to consider, that if you deny the historical fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel, as is recorded in the New Testament, then you literally deny that Jesus is the Messiah. You deny that Jesus is the one that, that Daniel prophesied to come. You're without a Messiah. You've trampled all over the cross. You've trampled all over his covenant, the covenant in his blood, the unconditional covenant in his blood. And without a Messiah, you have only hope in a lie. And that's what Satan has prepared for the whole quote-unquote Christian world. And we're going to see this this morning. Thanks for inviting me. It's my pleasure and my blessing to be here, York. Thanks. It's my pleasure, Tom, to have you on here, I really must say. And um, you said something very profound that a lot of people do not even think about. And you know that since quite some time, you and I, now, the la now lately also uh, together with Brett Norman, we gather every Sabbath to do a Bible study. And when we were starting that, you and I alone, uh, I think about a year ago or something, you always reminded me, Jörg, we are, now uh, we are now reading in the Gospel of Jesus Christ by Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. This is the 70th week of Daniel. That's right. Always remember that. And that got so th stuck in my brain that every time I open the Bible and I read in one of the four Gospels, automatically my brain says, this is the 70th week. Yes, sir. And, and when we go to Matthew, Tom, when we go to Matthew, chapter 20, uh, chapter, um, chapter uh, what's it called here? Wait, uh, chapter 18, mm -hmm. verse 21. If you want, you, my listener, not you, Tom, you have the confirmation. But if the listener, if the viewer of the video wants any confirmation that, for example, Matthew is speaking about the 70th week, Matthew chapter 18, verse 21 says, Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times. And Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. That's right. There is no better confirmation because in Daniel 9 it says that the Jews in, um, uh, I don't know, uh, Daniel chapter 9 verse, oh, let me just look that up in my Bible here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just, I'm just looking it up here. Um it's, I think, in chapter in, in verse 24, um, Daniel chapter 9, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins. Yeah. So, when in Matthew it says that Peter asked weeks. him, huh, how often shall I forgive my brother? And Jesus said, 70 times 7. This is 70 times a week, 70 weeks, because in chapter 9, verse 24 of Daniel, it says, and to make an end of sins. This right. will make an end of the sins. Yeah. Jesus, when he replied to Peter, not seven times, but 70 times 7 shall you forgive your brother who sins against you. And Jesus was literally telling Peter, I am the 70th week. This is the 70th week. It's been 70 times 7. Seven, 70 periods of 7 years since the going forth of the command to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be 7 weeks 62 weeks, and then one week. 62 plus 7 is 69, and 1 is 70. And Jesus was referring to the Jews and, and Peter among them that they are his brethren who had sinned against him 
70 times, seven times. And he was forgiving them on the 70th and final seven-year period of time. This was the time that Daniel prophesied to come, and Jesus with his own mouth confirmed that this is the 70th week of Daniel. When he said, I, you, I forgive my brother 70 times, seven times, he came to put an end of sin to make reconciliation for iniquity. And that's what he did on the cross. And to say that there's a future 70th week, what are we saying? We are denying the complete New Testament. That's right. That's, that's right. Exactly, that's exactly what the Jews did 2,000 years ago, because they live still in the Torah. They still live in the quote-unquote Old Testament, in the Law and the Prophets, because they don't accept Jesus Christ. That's and right. that's exactly what this Futurist teaching does with all of us. It makes yeah. us all from Babylon returning Jews. With his own mouth, Jesus confirmed that this was the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy, the time of the coming of Messiah. When Jesus replied to Peter the way he did, he was literally proclaiming himself to be the Messiah. And that he came to put an end of sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity. And that's what he did. So what do we say? when we ignorantly repeat the lies of the priesters behind the pulpits of our churches, that there is a future 70th week. How can you say there is a future 70th week of Daniel without denying Christ? That's their objective, to get you to deny that Jesus is the Christ so that you are free to accept a false Christ in a future refulfillment of Daniel's 70th week. It's the most subtle, the most tricky, the most devious lie ever told since the Garden of Eden. And, and virtually the entire Christian world believes this lie. You know, in this broadcast, depending on who's listening, we may not have any friends at all in this teaching. But this is the historical belief and teaching of the Protestant reformers. This is the perfect belief and teaching of all Protestants even before the Protestant Reformation. Yes, there were those who protested the papacy and the futurist lies and the preterist lies. They were few and far between and they were martyred for their belief that Jesus is the Messiah, the perfect and complete fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week. And the papacy is the Antichrist, the counterfeit Christ. And it's the papacy who has authored this futurist abomination and caused God's people out of their own mouths in the hope of a future 70th week to literally deny the gospel as recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the historical record of the precise and perfect fulfillment of Daniel, Daniel's prophecy in Messiah Jesus. To believe in a future 70th week is to deny the very ministry of Christ and his coming. If you believe in a future 70th week of Daniel, you just as well lop off the New Testament and burn it. That's how outrageous a lie futurism is. It literally causes us to reject Jesus as the Messiah. Now I know People who preach futurism also preach Jesus and him crucified. But you can't have it both ways. And Rome knows that. 
Rome is literally set out to make Protestantism look like a fool, and it has succeeded. Now we need to surprise Rome and return to the truth and expose the Jesuit-inspired futurist abomination And we can laugh at her for a change. Let us have her in derision. That's what we ought to do. We ought to hold the Roman Catholic Church in derision for foisting upon us this diabolical lie. Now, I get the pleasure, the blessing from Almighty God to share with your listeners how specifically it is recorded in the New Testament, the item-by-item historical fulfillment of every element of Daniel's prophecy. And what a pleasure and a blessing it is. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you, Tom. You know, the Christians that you were just talking about are mentioned in Matthew chapter 7 verse 22 because Jesus says many will say to me in that day Lord Lord have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works Mm -hmm. and we know how it goes on and what Jesus reply will be that's right and those are all the people that have been caught in the lie. That's right. Why have they been caught in the lie? Because they rather listen to man's teaching instead of picking up the word of God. The 1611 right. King James Bible where God personally speaks to every one of us and tells us yep. the truth. Yep. There is no bigger truth in this world than the Bible. Tom's words are nothing. My words are nothing. Nobody's words are are worth anything. It's the Bible that's worth everything. And the Bible should be your guide all through it. I mean, Tom's words are wonderful, and they can help you, probably, to pick up the Bible. Today, Tom, I received a comment on the very first part of this book reading that I published on my third video channel called Jörg Lisbon from a subscriber called Lori. She said, I I think that's a woman, I don't know, (laughs) but this avatar on YouTube, Lori, said, thank you for the truth. I just recently looked into preterism and I could see the same deception as futurism regarding the papacy. God Uh bless you, brother. There are few that speak of historicism and if not for you, I may not have known. Yeah, wonderful. And I wanted to share that with you, Tom, online, because you don't get that many positive response from your work, neither on Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio, nor with me, even though I tell you sometimes, look at the the comments, and this, I just saved this for today, to read this here online on this, uh, on this probably last broadcast on the uh, discussion, reading and discussion of this booklet, The Origin of Futurism and Preterism, because I really Mm -hmm. like that one, and she spoke right from my heart, and there are many more co- uh, comments like these on, on the video. So there are people, Tom, who get it, who yeah. finally get it, yeah, and pick up their Bibles and believe in God and God alone and not in the teaching of man. Yeah. Well, Yerk, I knew going into this that the success of Inquisition Update would not be measured by its popularity. Oh, no. (laughs) That if Inquisition Update was ever popular, it would be popularly hated. And that's what I expect. The truth has ever been hated in the world. And even by those who call themselves Christians. And that's just the lot that I drew. That's God... 
God is in this. I'm certainly not doing this for my own health. I'm certainly not doing it for my own good. Not here on this earth, I'm not. I fully expect, expect, expect the wrath of the Antichrist in Rome. She has forever persecuted the saints of God who for nearly 2,000 have proclaimed the papacy to be the Antichrist and that the historical fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel is in the New Testament. We have our Messiah. The sin issue has been dealt with permanently by our Messiah, according to Daniel's prophecy. There's no more question in our minds. It's only Rome that's challenged by that. And she controls the minds and the pulpits of the world. So, if I'm ever popular in this world, it's only going to be popularly hated. Not popularly affirmed, except by God's chosen few. That's what I expect, and that's what I got. There are many people going to go to their destruction believing in a futurist lie. They've denied Christ with their mouth. They have a false hope. I can't help what the truth is. This is my effort to correct the record. And I intend to carry it out. No matter what happens. Okay. Good. I'm going to go back to the reading of the book, The Origin of Futurism and Preterism. And we're going to start today on page 62. Uh, in the middle of the very first paragraph, because there is a quote from the Law and the Prophets, Jeremiah, chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. And it is important to reread this, which we have, uh, what we have already read last broadcast, because the book further deals with the same subject, the New Covenant, without taking anything away from that. We have been preparing for this a little bit. So Jeremiah 31, verse 31 through 34 reads, quote, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, after those days I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. And Praise the Lord. And why <clears throat> won't he remember our sin anymore? Because he sent his only begotten son to shed his blood that washed us free from that sin. That's right. Now the writer of the book of Hebrews repeats Jeremiah's prophecy and clearly applied it to the making and confirmation of the new covenant. In Hebrews chapter 8 verses 6 through 13 we read the same the exact same words that Paul cites in the book of Hebrews that Jeremiah just said here in the so-called Old Testament this is the new covenant that Jesus ratified with the sacrifice of his own blood as our Melchizedek priest during the last Passover meal <laughs> no no I, I, I can't read on during the last Passover meal. Why was this the last Passover meal? 
because in Daniel chapter 9 it says the sacrifices and oblations to cease. Yes. There is no more Passover feast because Jesus became the perfect lamb after the right. last Passover meal. That's right. That's why today we have communion, as Jesus said, take this bread, this is my body, and this is the wine, this is my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. That has nothing mm -hmm. to do with the Passover. So the Jews who are still celebrating Passover today are celebrating an abomination right. to God. And this is exactly what the whole futurist agenda leads to. Yep. Building, rebuilding Solomon's temple for the third time and start sacrifices, animal sacrifices again, so that the Jews can eat and drink damnation to themselves. That's right. Where we read here, as our Melchizedek priest during the last Passover meal with his disciples, our Savior Jesus Christ affirmed the fact that by the shedding of his blood, a new covenant was made. Now Daniel chapter 9 verse 27 says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. What do you one think this covenant the author speaks about here? Exactly right. that new covenant he speaks about here. Praise the Lord. He said, For this is my blood of the New Testament, or the new covenant, which is set, shed for many for the remission of sins. Unquote. We're going to put an end of sins to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring it and to anoint the most holy. That's Daniel's prophecy. Yeah. And G Jesus confirms in Matthew chapter 26, verse 26 through 28, this is what he did. He confirmed the covenant in his blood with many for one week, seven year period of time. It began at his baptism. Three and a half years later, he became the sacrifice. He said, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. For us. And then for three and a half years, with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, that gospel was continued to be preached to the Jews and Jerusalem until the end of that seven-year period of time. And then we find recorded in the Scripture the first salvation to the Gentiles, the house of Cornelius. Or is, do we need more witness than what is written in the New Testament? The record of the 70th and final week? Or are we going to believe liars behind the pulpits? Are we going to believe the priests and the priesters behind the pulpits of the churches and deny the true 70th week in hope, in a false hope for a future 70th week? Shall we comprehend what their purpose is? It can only be to deny that Jesus was the Messiah and to present to the world at the end of time a false messiah. That can only be their agenda. That's what futurism is. Lock, stock, and barrel. It's straight from the pit. He says, for this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And now you know exactly why Jesus said when Peter asked, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times? Jesus said, no. Seventy times, seven times. That was a direct reference to Daniel's 70-week prophecy. Jesus was literally telling P Peter, I am the Messiah, Daniel prophesied to come in the 70th and final week of his prophecy. I will make reconciliation for iniquity. I will put an end of sins. 
I will make a new covenant with my people, a covenant they cannot break because they have no part in it. I make an unconditional covenant with my people. I will become the sacrifice. Since you cannot obey my laws, you cannot earn your salvation, then I must take it all upon myself. I must do it all myself and become the Lamb of God, the perfect Lamb that God will never reject. And we're just benefactors of what he did for us. It's a gift. All the Bible proves that man always broke God's covenants. Well, this one we cannot break because it's unconditional and it's completely one-sided. He made a promise, a covenant in his blood, and he kept it. And it's a done deal. No one can change what he did. No one can add to it. No one can take away from it. It's guaranteed. It's in safe hands. It's in Jesus' hands. It's in God's hands alone. Every attempt God made in the past failed because it, they were conditional covenants. They depended upon Israel obeying, and they always broke his covenants. And that's the whole fallacy of man, the whole total depravity of man. He cannot obey in his fallen state. So it's up to God not alone. If there's to be any salvation for mankind, it has to be from God's hand, unconditional. So he sent his own son, made him the lamb whose blood covers all of our sins. And if we are saved, it's only because of the abundant mercy of God, the grace of Almighty God. And what is grace? Unmerited favor. We had absolutely nothing to do with it. And that's how come we're guaranteed our salvation because Jesus paid it all. Only he was obedient unto death. Only he was sufficient a sacrifice, a perfect sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. And so he became the lamb. Seventy times seven, he forgave his brethren. And then he ended sin. He put an end of sin and made reconciliation between God and men in the man Christ Jesus. This is, this, this is what Rome hates the most. For God's people to fully comprehend what Jesus accomplished for them. Because the Pope wants to be the spiritual ruler and he cannot be the spiritual ruler if our salvation is already achieved. If the kingdom of heaven, if the kingdom of Christ is already established in the world, what need is there in the world for a pope? So they must destroy the comprehension among God's people that Jesus is the alpha and the omega of that covenant. Man had nothing to do with it. Jesus accomplished it all on his own, without our help, without our compliance, without our assistance, and in spite of our sins, he covered it all. He made reconciliation for all of us. Now, if we be reconciled to God, what need in the world is there for a pope? But the Pope insists that he's the vicar of Christ, the replacement of the Son of God on earth, and every man, woman, and child on the planet must be his subject and obey him, and him only. 
And so they need a refulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel according to their terms. So what Messiah do you think they're going to present to us at the end of that future 70th week of Daniel? It's going to be the papacy. The Antichrist of the Bible. I hope I've made it clear to your listeners, but we're not done yet. Go ahead, Yerk. They will present to us a Messiah, Tom, who will deprive us of eternal life. That's right. Who will lead us into eternal damnation because that that's exactly right. is what Satan wants. Satan hates man that's from right. the beginning. And the extirpation of man was his goal from the beginning and will be his goal until the end. Okay, first of all, many shall fall down and worship him because he wants to be worshipped. But in the end, he'll kill us all because we are nothing yep. to him. That's right. And our Messiah, Jesus Christ, promises us eternal life, whereas the false Messiah promises us eternal damnation. So the choice, dear listener, is yours. What do you choose? Do you love life or do you hate your life? Well, <laughs> I have to say, a lot of people probably listening saying, I hate my life because I live in this world and I mm. don't understand this world and this world hates me and I cannot enjoy myself because I cannot be myself. I am not free. My conscience is not free. My speech is not free. Whenever I try to speak or exercise my free conscience, I am running against boundaries that I did not set. And a lot of people are very, very unhappy in their life. Well, let me tell you people, I was the same way. And there is only one way that can set you free of these boundaries. And that's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ gives us the freedom with which he made us free. And when we have that peace that he bestows on us because we accept that he died for our sins on the cross, we know that nothing in this world can take away the promise of our eternal life together with him in his kingdom. We only have to endure here. And while we are enduring, well, we can better do his work instead of the work of the Antichrist. That, by the way, is why Tom and I are here. Yeah. We are doing, or we are just doing what the Holy Spirit calls us to do. Yeah. But let's go back to the book. On the bottom of page 62, it says, The angelic messenger plainly stated this sixfold purpose of this 70 weeks of or 490 year period. Now, the angelic messenger, who is this angelic messenger? We are speaking about the Archangel Gabriel, who yes. explains this prophecy to Daniel after he went on his knees and prayed for his people and prayed for the forgiveness of the sins of Jerusalem in the first part of Daniel chapter 9. That is a wonderful, wonderful prayer. And we should read that daily and remind ourselves of speaking the same words to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Ask for forgiveness for what we've done. The angelic messenger plainly stated the sixfold purpose <clears throat> of this 70 weeks or 490 year period. The messianic purpose was, first, to finish the transgression. And we can read that in uh, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, and also in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 12 through 14. Now, may, may I read both of those for the listeners? Absolutely. I'd love you to, Tom. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5. But he, Messiah, was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. 
not will be, we are healed. In other words, he finished the transgression. He made reconciliation for iniquity. And in verse he in, in, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12, it says, but this man, remember the New Testament is the literal written recording of the fulfillment in Jesus Christ of every element of Daniel's prophecy. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12 records this. But this man, we're talking about Jesus, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. What did he make sacrifices for? The sacrifice for sins forever. Okay? Did he finish the transgression? Did he make an end of sins? Did he make reconciliation for iniquity? Yes. During the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy. Point two, Yerk. Oh, I just um, read uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 13, because it goes 12 through 14. And I was just thinking, Tom, because... Verse 13 reads, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Yeah. Isn't, uh, is, isn't this a correction of the teaching of the Seventh-day Adventists with their investigative judgment? Well, it could very well be. Certainly, uh, they, they say that, uh, and I don't want to get into a big discussion about the errors of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, but uh, they say the judgment's ongoing right now. But, uh, and, here it says, and here it says that he sits down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. When are Jesus Christ's enemies be made his footstool? When, when he, he comes, comes back. back. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. But so let's, let's, I mean, it's something our listeners maybe should reflect on because a lot of people say, well, the Seventh-day Adventists are so wonderful and so great. You really have to deeply study your Bible, believe me, to see the, uh, how do you say that, <laughs> the hyenas <laughs> lies, the hyenas crime of lies they put in there, or false interpretation. You really, really have to pay much attention. And um, I mean, this, this thought just came up when reading Hebrews 13, because we were talking about that before, this investigative judgment. Who on earth can ever check, check what happened so-called in 1844 in heaven when they say Christ went from the holy place to the most holy place? Come on, nobody can check that. Check you your can't Bible. verify it in the scriptures, that's yeah, for sure. You yeah. cannot verify it in the scriptures. Now, on the Daniel's prophecy, you can verify every single element from the scriptures. Exactly. You cannot verify the Seventh Day Adventist doctrine of the of the of of the investigative judgment from the scriptures. It doesn't exist. And that's the point that I wanted to make, Tom. Okay. Now, okay, the messianic purpose point two was to make an end of sins, as we can read in Hebrews chapter nine, verse twenty six. Please and Tom. Here is Hebrews chapter nine, verse twenty six. For then must he have uh, for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Did he put away sin? Did he make an end of sins? As is declared in Daniel's prophecy, the historical record in the New Testament testifies he did just that. Now in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. That's it. Are you still waiting for a future fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel? Point three. To make reconciliation for iniquity, as we can confirm in Romans chapter 5, verse 10, 
and in Hebrews chapter 10, but this time verse 17. Okay, here's Romans chapter 5, verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Okay, did he make reconciliation for iniquity? You bet, and he did it when we were still counted enemies. We had no part in it. In other words, Jesus saved us by his own blood and made reconciliation to God for us in our behalf, even in our rebellion and sin. We're no better than the Hebrews. We're no better than the Israelites. We are no more capable of taking part in our own salvation as, as a dog. Totally depraved. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that seeketh after God. So we're in a hopeless and helpless situation until Christ literally came and redeemed us by making himself the sacrifice. And that's how he satisfied God's law. And that's how we, who were born dead in trespasses and sins, are now reconciled unto God and our sins are remembered no more. Now, did he make reconciliation for iniquity or did he not? All right. That's Romans chapter 10. Now, here's t Hebrews chapter 10, verse 17. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. I have to keep asking the question, where's the hope in a future 70th week of Daniel? There is no hope in a future 70th week of Daniel. I'm much better like the first one. Point, point four. To bring in everlasting righteousness, as confirmed in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. And here's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, in God's infallible word to man, the authorized King James Version. It says, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. There's your Messiah there's your everlasting righteousness. You want to be everlastingly righteous? Then accept him as your propitiation. Don't look for a future Christ to do this for you. Jesus is the only sinless one. He was the only one that was worthy to bear our sins on his body. He never violated God's law in one count. He was the spotless lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And if we have any hope at all, we have it only in him. So what purpose does a 70th week of Daniel pre present? A lie. The very denial that Jesus was that propitiation. To deny that Jesus was the Messiah. That's the whole purpose of selling you the future a 70th week of Daniel. <clears throat> this should be plainly evident to anybody that's listening now. You notice I don't have any fair speech. I don't have anything uh, uh, in human terms that a man would desire. I'm no theologian. I'm no doctor of divinity. I'm a sinner saved by the almighty God, merciful God who sent a propitiation for me. Even when I was considered an enemy, Christ died for me. You don't need a doctor of divinity or a theological degree to come up with the simple truth of the gospel. You don't need a priest. You don't need a priester. You don't need Mary 
you don't need the churches of today who are apostate, ecumenical, evangelical, belly, Romeward bound, demonized Christian churches. They're liars. You can't pass through the doors of any church today without talking about the rapture and a future antichrist. And they have completely twisted the gospel. They don't understand it. You know what God's going to say to them? Depart from me, I never knew you. For God said, for those he foreknew, he also did predestinate. That's right. For those he foreknew, he also did predestinate. Now guess which ones he's going to cast out? Those he didn't foreknow. Those he didn't predestinate. Those will be those who will believe the lie of a future 70th week of Daniel. That's where the line in the sand is drawn. We know how to identify them. If they believe in a future 70th week of Daniel, they have denied the historical, the biblical, and the prophetic fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel in Christ 2,000 years ago. They can preach Jesus till the cows come home, but they take his name in vain. They take his name in vain. It's vanity. It has no use for them. Matthew chapter 7, Tom, makes that point. Yep. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Yep. And that, sadly enough, works for the majority of quote-unquote Christians of today. That's right. That's right. Now verse or point five. Point five is to seal up the vision and prophecy. And uh, I want to remind my listeners that there are many people out there who say that Jesus Christ did not seal up the vision and prophecy. And one of them, I have to mention his name, is Eric John Phelps. Right. I've heard it from his own mouth. I even have the MP3 on my computer where he says that Jesus did not seal up the vision and prophecy, but the Bible in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 17, rebukes him. Tom. That's right. He says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Okay? And whenever a, 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 a prophecy or a testimony is fulfilled, it is rolled up and sealed. Rolled up and sealed. And anyone who dares to reopen that seal and unscroll that scroll and add to it or take away from it has violated the law of God. Okay, when God says it is finished, it's finished. And when you open up the seal and try to amend it, or in this case, have a complete redo of it in the future, you have put a curse upon yourself. You become part of the futurist refulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. And there's a judgment awaiting you. Okay. What do you do when you finish reading the scripture, when they finish reading the scrolls in, in the synagogues of Jerusalem? They rolled it up and they put the seal back on it. It's finished. Okay, when God has spoken, he has spoken. If, if, if we try to open it up and amend it or change it in any way, we brought a curse upon ourselves. Now, what have they done by opening up Daniel's scroll, which was perfectly and completely fulfilled 
as recorded in the New Testament during the 70th and final week of Daniel by our own Messiah. They want to redo it. They don't want to just amend it. They want to redo the whole thing. They want to rewrite the scroll. And when Eric John Phelps says that God did not seal up, he's simply saying Jesus wasn't the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. We need a future do-over. Now, I know he doesn't see it that way, but that's the way I see it, and that's the way the Scriptures see it. When God's finished, he's made his decree, he seals it up. He puts a wax seal on it, and he stamps his official ring right on it. No one but the king is able to open up this scroll. And that's why in the vision, there's scroll with seals on it, seven seals, sealed by Almighty God. Jesus fulfilled the covenant. You can't add to it. You can't take away from it. You can't alter it in any way. You can't even open it. For he who seals it is the only one who can open it again. And futurism not only opens the seal, it completely rewrites the scroll. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you, Tom. The messianic, messianic purpose, point six, was to anoint the most holy, as we can read for confirmation in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verse 18, and also in the book of Acts, chapter 10, verse 38. And here is Luke, chapter 4, verse 18, and I will add also verse 19. It saith, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me. There's your anointing. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and the recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. What is the acceptable year of the Lord? Well, the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel. Two thousand years ago, when Jesus was anointed in the River Jordan by John the Baptist. That's when the Most Holy was anointed according to Daniel's prophecy. It's never, ever, ever going to happen again. It happened once. And it was all sufficient. The Most Holy was anointed. He became the sacrifice for many. In the midst of the week, he caused the sacrifices and the oblations to cease. And how do we know he caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease? Because the Scripture plainly tells us that when he said, it is finished, the veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom. It fell apart in two pieces, and it fully exposed the quote-unquote holy of holies. No more would the great high priest of Israel pass through that veil once a year to make sacrifice for the sins of Israel. Jesus did it once and for all. And God ripped that veil of that temple from top to bottom to see to it no one would ever offer a sacrifice again. Jesus is the lamb. Take him or leave him. That was his message to the Jews, and that's his message to the world. There is, therefore, now no more sacrifice for sin. Jesus did it right the first time. And he did it only once, because only once was necessary. So what do we want a future temple built in Jerusalem for? Are they going to sew back the veil of the temple from two pieces into one? Are they going to have a great high priest to make sacrifices and to place blood in the altar 
uh, on the on the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies, and for what purpose? To eat and drink damnation to themselves, to prove once again that they deny Jesus as their perfect Lamb, putting an end of sin. Why would anyone make re make sacrifices for sins if the sin issue has already been solved? It's a literal denial that Jesus satisfied God's law. It's a literal denial that Jesus was the Messiah. That's what they believed 2,000 years ago when they crucified him. That's what they believe today. So why does the whole Christian world, having the King James Bible accessible to them where it says God no longer dwells in temples made with hands, why do they want to build a temple when they know God isn't going to dwell in it? And God isn't going to accept any more sacrifices for sin. His son already did that. He did it perfectly. He did it completely. It can only be for the purpose to cause the world to eat and drink damnation to themselves. And you find the whole Christian world in support of the Jews living in their land, building a temple to begin animal sacrifices again. You have to be able to comprehend from now on at least by now, how totally depraved the so-called Christian world is. How deluded. How deceived. The Bible plainly says that if it were possible, he would deceive the very elect. <clears throat> well, I'll tell you something. It's not possible to deceive God's very elect. So those who are hoping for a future temple and a future animal sacrifices, they must not be God's elect. I told you this wouldn't be popular. And it's not. The truth never was popular, Tom. It's popularly hated. People have been persecuted for the truth all through the history of mankind. That's right. And it will stay that way until the day that Jesus uh, returns. All right. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. Acts chapter 10, verse 38 how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. There's the anointing of the Most Holy. Is there anything left of Daniel's prophecy that isn't perfectly and completely fulfilled in the 70th week of Daniel, during Jesus' ministry, the ministry of the Messiah, the covenant in his blood, is there any portion of Daniel's 70 weeks that's yet to be fulfilled? Not one iota. Not one iota. So what do you do when you start talking about a future 70th week of Daniel. Seven years of great tribulation. I'll tell you what, there's going to be seven years of great tribulation. When they figure out that they've rejected the fullness of the 70th week of Daniel in their Messiah, Jesus, the one they preach with their mouth, and they turn around and hope for a future fulfillment, and when they suddenly realize what they're really doing is denying that Jesus was the fulfillment, denying that Jesus was the 70th week of Daniel. Jesus' ministry was the 70th week of Daniel. Beginning at his baptism, his anointing by the Holy Ghost, his death on the cross three and a half years later, the continually witnessing through the Spirit-filled apostles for the remaining three and a half years of that prophecy, and then the salvation of the house of Cornelius. And what eventually happened was the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in 70 AD. Well, so there, somebody would ask the question legitimately, well, why did God allow Jerusalem and the temple to be destroyed? Because he knew they, they rejected him. 
And there's no way God is ever going to receive any more sacrifices of animals on that Temple Mount in Jerusalem. That's why he called the 10th Legion of the Roman Empire to come down and besiege the city and destroy the people of Daniel and the temple and Jerusalem. They rejected their Messiah. Now, common sense dictates if the Jews did not accept Jesus as their Messiah, then what would they most want to do? to sew up the veil of the temple, to hang it back up, to reinstitute the priesthood, to make animals, to continue to make animal sacrifices. If they rejected Jesus, the only thing they had left was Temple Mount worship. It was good for uh, Mo, from Moses' time until then. If they reject Jesus as the Messiah, not knowing the time of their visitation, not knowing what Daniel told them in, the 70, in, the, in his 70-week prophecy, then they had no alternative but to return to animal sacrifices to confirm their rejection of Jesus. And God wouldn't have it anymore. God would not have his people deceived, so he had the temple destroyed permanently. It was God who was in the works in 70 A.D. And just as he used ancient Babylon to bring the house of Judah into captivity for their idolatry, so he brought the Roman Empire to destroy idolatrous Israel, Judah, for rejecting their Messiah for not knowing the time of their visitation. It was in black and white in their Bible in Daniel chapter 9. God literally put an X on the calendar 483 years from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. What is that? 69 weeks. At the end of the 69th week began the 70th week, Daniel's 70th week, the seven-year ministry of Christ. It's all been fulfilled in history perfectly and completely. But the churches all teach a future 70th week of Daniel. They're all apostate deniers of Christ. Every one of them. And who do they believe? They don't believe their King James Bible. They believe the Jesuit priests who foisted this futurist lie upon the Christian world, and all for the purpose of presenting the world during this so-called 70th week of Daniel, a different Messiah. And for confirmation of the words of the priest, Tom, they read the corrupted NIV or New King James or any other kind of New Age Bible that are all written in a sense like the Schofield Reference Bible that are all written in the sense that when you read that you will learn of the futurist antichrist teaching I say not deception because these Bibles are made to deceive you in the first place when you when you seek confirmation of anything your pastor says just pick up the bible your pastor holds in his hand and you will understand that what he says is quote unquote true but when you pick up the real bible the 1611 authorized version you are able to expose your pastor, you are able to expose your priest, you are able to expose the Roman Catholic Church, the Jesuit-led seminaries, and everything in it as what they are. Yeah. But only then. And that's why The King James Bible is under attack from all sides. That's right. I 
cannot even count the many attacking comments that I get on my videos mm -hmm. when I defend the King James Bible as the only preserved true word of God in the English language in our times today. Whether in my German spoken videos or in my English spoken videos, I'm getting attacked and attacked and attacked. And you know what? I like it. Because if I wouldn't get attacked, it probably would not be the truth. Because there's yep. no need to attack a lie. Shall we continue the reading, Tom? Yes, by all means. On page 63, on the second paragraph, the author continues, The anointing of the Most Holy, which we just spoke about, refers to Jesus Christ when he was anointed at his water baptism, which marked the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel. Bravo! Here yes, now amen. the author Praise is the exactly saying the words that we are teaching through all Absolutely. the last 13 broadcasts of reading yes. and discussing this book. And what Tom says since more than 10 years on Inquisition Update, where everywhere he gets a mic before his mouth. That's right. In Mark chapter 1, verse 15, Jesus said, The time is fulfilled. Referring to the beginning of his public ministry and his work of redemption on the cross for his people. In the middle of the 70th week, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, was cut off or crucified, as we can read in Daniel chapter 9, verses 26 through 27. At his crucifixion, Jesus caused the Levitical sacrifices to cease and made reconciliation for our sins. Of a reference, read Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. At his crucifixion, Jesus caused the Levitical sacrifices to cease. He abolished right. the Levitical law, That's right. the ceremonial law. He did not abolish the Ten Commandments. No. But he didn't come to abolish, as he said before, but to fulfill. He right. fulfilled the sacrificial laws of the Levites at that time because he became the perfect and the only lamb that God would ever throughout all history accept. Because yep. all the animals that have been slain before the altar of God in the Old Testament, not one of them, their blood, has ever redeemed anybody from any sin. That's right. But the belief of the people that this blood would shed their sins away, that was what set them free. That was what gave them the grace of, uh, what made them receive the grace of God. The belief, not the blood. That's right. At his crucifixion, Jesus caused the Levitical sacrifices to cease and made reconciliation for our sins. Through biblical exegesis, and a basic understanding of history. Please, people, listen well. A basic understanding of history. How can we today get a basic understanding of history when all our schools, universities, libraries, seminaries, churches, everything is through and through, uh, how, how can you say that, equipped? with corrupted history when right. there is no history on yeah let's say it the television everybody watches television today history channel or hitlery channel as i like to call it they do not tell us the real truth they tell us the truth they want us to tell it is very very in, uh, important that we understand that we really need the true history through biblical exegesis and a basic understanding of history, but real history. It is very mm -hmm. evident that all 70 weeks, all of them, were completely fulfilled. Nowhere in this prophecy of Daniel chapter 9, nowhere in that prophecy do you read anywhere or does it make any reference to a one-man antichrist? 
It does not make any reference to a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. It does not make any reference to quote-unquote the Antichrist making a covenant with the Jews. It does not make any prophecy uh, in the prophecy you can read nowhere about quote-unquote the Antichrist breaking a covenant. And also you read nowhere in Daniel chapter 9, the 70th week of Daniel being separated from the 69th week with a quote-unquote gap of at least 2,000 years. You just don't read it. You can interpret it when you listen to the interpretation of man, when you listen to the interpretation of a Roman Catholic priest, when you listen to the interpretation of a Jesuit, when you listen to the interpretation of the pastor who is probably a Freemason in your Baptist or Methodist or whatever church that you are visiting. When you listen to him, yes, you can be deceived. But take the King James Bible, open it on Daniel chapter 9, read the complete chapter for yourself, and you will see that the 70th week of Daniel being separated from the 69th week with a gap of 2,000 years is nowhere mentioned. Try right. They can't find a biblical proof for any of their futurist elements. We just demonstrated that all six elements of Daniel's prophecy about the 70th week of Daniel were recorded in the New Testament. You want proof? You go to the book of history, the Bible. Daniel prophesied one thing, the New Testament records its fulfillment. But in futurism, what they preach from the pulpits, they cannot prove one element of it from the scripture. They can't prove that there's a one-man antichrist. The fact of the matter is every pope in succession from the first pope to the last has been the antichrist of his age. They hold an office. It's the office of antichrist. Just like no president of the United States has ever lost the presidency, whether he died or whatever, he's still regarded as president. They are succession because they hold the office, which never dies. The man of sin, the Antichrist, is a dynasty of popes. Okay? But they would have us believe that the Antichrist of the Bible is just one single solitary man that doesn't come until just before Christ's return. They cannot verify it in Scripture. It's not there. They talk about a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. Where in the Bible does it say the Jews are going to return to their land and build a temple? It's not there. They say that the Antichrist will make a covenant with the Jews. Show me that in Scripture. It does not exist. It was Jesus who confirmed a covenant with many for one week. There's not no other covenant. Okay? They say that the Antichrist is going to break the covenant. No, Jesus confirmed the covenant, and then he fulfilled it by, shed, by shedding his own blood for us. Okay? And the 70th week of Daniel being separated from the 69th week should just be laughable to anybody with two neurons to rub together. It's just laughable on its face that God is such a bad timekeeper that he can't tell there's 2,000. What did he do? Go to sleep for 2,000 years before he fulfilled the, the, caught up to the 70th week of Daniel? I mean, it's absurd. I don't mean to make light of it. It's diabolical what they teach in the churches. It's diabolical what they, let, let me ask you this. Daniel plainly broke up those 70 weeks into three separate periods. First seven weeks, then 62 weeks, which makes 69 weeks altogether, and then one week, which makes 70 weeks total. Now, if there's a 2,000-year gap between the 69th and 70th week, where's the 2,000-year gap between the seven weeks and the 62 weeks? Well, there isn't. They were consecutive. And so is the 70th week, consecutive with the 69th. 
it happened, it was fulfilled exactly and perfectly and completely 2,000 years ago, just as it was prophesied by Daniel. Daniel's prophecy is perfectly and completely fulfilled. The scroll has been rolled up and sealed. But all of these futurist things suggest a completely different interpretation of Daniel's prophecy. And they say that the Antichrist is going to confirm a covenant. <laughs> now that's diabolical, isn't it? Yeah, because they make of Jesus the Antichrist. That's right. That's what they're attempting to do. It's an attempt to deny that Jesus was the Christ. And he who denies that Jesus is not the Christ and not come in the flesh has the spirit of Antichrist, the Bible says. Let me, let me tell you, if the whole world comprehended what we've, what we've been trying to tell, tell everybody, if everybody comprehends what we've said, the churches would be empty tomorrow. No one would go to a church next Sunday. If only people were interested in what we say, Tom. That's right. If they're only interested in what the Scripture said, what the Scripture saith, and what history in the, in the New Testament confirms, there wouldn't be one single soul in the churches next Sunday. Lies upon lies compounded with lies of false hope and a denial of Jesus. That's what it is. It says in the Scripture, Satan is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, his ministers are transformed into the ministers of righteousness. Satan's ministers are transformed into ministers of righteousness. That, too, has been fulfilled right before your very eyes. Speaking of and all the what, pastors and all the priests and all the politicians. Right. And anybody that preaches futurism or preterism, they become the ministers of unrighteousness, posing as the ministers of righteousness. I've always asked my listeners, where do you think Satan would have the most influence? If he could... If he could have access to anything in the world to preach his lies, where do you suspect he would preach them? Well, from the churches. And that's exactly where he, that's exactly where he occupies space now. In the churches. To deceive, if it were possible, the very elect. And they are deceived and being deceived. They loveth and maketh a lie. They repeat lies, and they have pleasure in them that repeat the lies. I was one of them. Not anymore. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. Well, we have come to an hour 20, an hour discussion and reading of this wonderful book and I think we almost did a page of the last five pages that we have to read here uh, if it's okay with you Tom I would suggest uh, to take a break and then continue or shall we make an appointment on another day I don't know how fit your voice still is because this was quite uh, intense let's uh, let's do it another time and begin to lose my voice uh, I thought so so yeah so then, dear listeners, next time we will take upon us the work of reading on page 63 the paragraph concerning the two witnesses before we come to the last part of the last chapter of this book, The Tragic Aftermath of Futurism. For today, I want to thank Tom Fress for attending me on the broadcast here on Hour of the Truth Meets Inquisition Update for the reading and discussion of the book The Origin of Futurism and Preterism written by Charles Jennings and Paul Owen. I hope that you all learned from what we had to say today and um, pick up your Bible. But I will make a last statement after Tom has said goodbye. Please Tom, your final words to our listeners and viewers of the video please today. 
Yes, by all means, pick up your Bible, but just make sure it's the authorized King James Version of the Bible. Amen. <laughs> it's the only one that tells the truth. And the reason you know it is because all the counterfeit Bibles, all the most popular Bibles in the world today, can't agree with one another, let alone agree with the King James Bible. Proof positive that Satan controls the false Bibles of the world, and there's only one that tells the truth. Okay? You can always tell a liar when he contradicts himself. And every one of these false Bibles, the NASB, the, the, the NIV, you name them, they can't agree with one another. Their house is divided, and terrible will be the fall of them. Don't rely on them. They're ecumenical Bibles. They're preparing you for a 70th, a future 70th week of Daniel, and they're all lies. And so with that, I'll depart with my usual salutation, blessing in the name of the one who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ, our Messiah and Lamb of God, the true and only King of kings and Lord of lords. Thank you, Yerk, and blessings to your listeners. I'll see you next time. Thank you, Tom. Now, my dear listeners, um, I am holding in my hand a book from Martin Luther, um, one of his works, Luther's Works, Volume 41, Church and Ministry. And it is years ago that I read somewhere that Luther is quoted as said, if I knew the world would end tomorrow, I would today plant an apple tree. It's possible that Luther said that, it's possible he didn't. Another thing that I picked up from Luther, and I'm not a Lutheran, but another thing that I picked up from him was that the very first book of the Old Testament that Luther translated from the, at that time, only accessible Bible versions in Latin, he translated into German. The very first book of the so-called Old Testament was the book of Daniel. Now you can think of Tom and of me and of our telling you and ranting sometimes whatever you want. But if that is true, that Luther first translated the book of Daniel from the Old Testament, I don't say it is true, but I say if it is true, then you can maybe understand why we are putting such an emphasis on Daniel chapter 9. The whole book of Daniel starting in chapter 2 and going through the lot of other chapters, tells all about the end time, tells all about all the kingdoms in the world and what is going to happen with them, long before John ever wrote the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's why the book of Daniel is such a very important book. And that is why in the Jewish Bible, the book of Daniel is not included into the book of the prophets. Oh, no, 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 no. And that is why there is a Talmudic curse on everyone who reads Daniel chapter 9 with the intent to understand the first coming of Jesus Christ. Look it up. Rabbinic or Talmudic curse. Something to reflect on. Until next time. Juggler 66 from O of the Truth says, God bless you, and bye-bye. We must start at the foot of the cross. For our souls in danger, we're at loss. And when we kneel in that awesome place, at that very moment, you'll feel God's grace. Friend, let me tell you, you need to know, there is heaven, also hell below. Christ died on that cross to set you free from your vile sins and hell's agony. You're God's enemy without the cross. Reject Christ and to God your dross. To the prison of hell he will send just Christ's work on the cross makes amends. God hates those who try to enter in the gates of heaven still full of sin. Only his son can take sin away, go to the foot of the cross, this day. 
God has provided only one way to enter heaven's wondrous array. Except what Jesus did for us all, he paid our debt so hell won't befall. Go to the foot of the cross this day, his precious blood washes sin away. We each need to think more of his cross, without our Savior we're total loss.